Hello everyone, it's Mrs. Gore and I'm back for another lesson today. And uh, this is sixth grade ELA, so, um, and this is on Double Learning Lab. So we are working on author's purpose, uh, being that this is ELA, and we're working on informational texts, which we have talked a little bit about. And today we're gonna look at some different types, look at author's purpose. So um, if you've heard that term before, which I'm sure that you have in some capacity, that's what we're going to be talking about, and you're going to just um, learn more about it. And if, if it's something that is still uh, confusing to you, we're going to talk about it more and really um, have a better understanding when we're done with this lesson today. So let's jump into this. You just need a you know paper and pencil, um, like usual, for notes. And we'll be doing a little bit of writing. So go ahead and pause the video if you would like to run and grab a paper and a pencil. Uh, you will need it for a little bit later. Okay, so if you've got your materials all ready, uh, we will go ahead and go to the next slide and talk about what we're going to be doing today. So our objectives are always what we're uh, what this lesson is about. So what we're gonna be doing and what we're gonna be able to do at the end of the lesson, okay? So uh, at the end of this lesson, I can articulate the author's purpose in informational text. It's one thing we'll be able to do. The next thing is, uh, right here, the second one says, I can explain how the author's point of view in a text is conveyed in an informational text. Okay, so it's a lot of big words. We're gonna go over those in our vocabulary so that you kind of get better feel. So you saw that word articulate. Let's talk about that word. That means express an idea or feeling fluently. So that's what articulate means. It's basically uh, you being able to explain, you know, something that you have read, say in your own words, or um, just you understand it completely and you're telling someone about it. That's articulating. Uh, convey. That means to make an idea or feeling known or understandable to someone. Kind of the same idea. Uh, usually that has to do with what the author is doing. So the author is making an idea or a feeling known or understandable to someone with their writing. So if you know what articulate and convey mean, they're similar uh, in that way. Then our informational text, like I said, we have talked about that in some other types of um, lessons, and that is your nonfiction writing, which means it's true, right? It's, it's factual. Uh, it's nonfiction writing written with the intention of informing the reader about a specific topic. Okay, so it's informational. It's nonfiction. It is uh, true, true writing. Okay, and author's purpose is basically why did the author write this piece? Uh, this is the reason that the author has for writing the text, okay? Putting it out there for someone to read. That is author's purpose, okay? So again, if you want to write those terms down, we always like to do that with our vocabulary if possible, and that way you can kind of uh, have those notes in front of you for the rest of the lesson as well, because they do help to be able to look back at them and uh, kind of know at a glance what you're looking at. So there's your notes. If you can pause this this time uh, for the notes, if not, just we'll go ahead and continue. Okay, this is kind of the agenda. This is the schedule we're going to follow today. And the first thing we were going to do was review our vocabulary, which we already did. Um, it's a little bit out of order, I guess. Uh, number two is talk about the PIED method for finding author's purpose. You guys may have heard about PI or PIED. We're going to talk some more about that. We're going to read some texts and find the author's purpose. And then we're going to practice writing an informational text. Okay? So that is our agenda that we will follow for this lesson. Now, this slide, I wanted to kind of show a fun way to show. Uh, what informational text is because it you know it's not just a big long you know article or a big long piece of writing or, or a book um, it can be a lot of different things so informational text 
can be, we know it's nonfiction, so I have that word here, nonfiction. We also know it's informational down here in the red, informational. Um, but if you look at all these words on this page, we have things like charts, captions, um, headings, glossaries, and diagrams. And the word bold means that usually these things are in bold if it's something that's important, right? Um, it's also text, any type of writing uh, it can be informational. So at this moment, I had actually went ahead and gathered up a couple of um, things I found around my house that were different types of informational text. So I was just going to show you. This is a book called Useful Knots. Okay, my, my older sons, they're about your guys' age. Um, one of them was really interested in, you know, how to tie different knots, like for fishing or something. And so that's an informational text. And it kind of has some how-tos inside, how to, how to tie these knots. That's an informational text. Um, this one also is a field and stream little outdoor guide. Okay, so it's full of, it actually has some, not tying in there too, but it has some different ways to, um, you know, build a fire when you're out in the woods or just different things for survival. So that's an informational text. I also have here a, it's called Painless Algebra. So it's a book that teaches you about algebra. It breaks down algebra for you. It's very useful. And that's an informational text. I also have, hmm, my cookbook from my kitchen. Okay, so there's a cookbook, definitely an informational text. It's it's full of recipes to tell you how to make certain types of foods. Informational text. I also have this newspaper here. Okay, so we have a newspaper, definitely informational text, and it's full of all types of different kinds of stories. So, uh, even just one informational text like a newspaper can have a lot of different types of articles in it. So that is a little bit about informational text. Okay, and we'll move to the next slide. So this is our fun little chart that has, oh, that piece, those pies are making me hungry. Um, cherry pie especially. But this is the get pied with author's purpose. So the P-I-I, sorry, P-I-E-E-D, is basically what we're getting when we go down. Okay, that spells out P I E E D. So get pied. So the first in this is persuade. That's the first word. And that is the first type of um, author's purpose. The, the type of writing that's going to take place in this type of a text is to persuade. The author wants to persuade or convince someone to. Uh, do something or like something, okay? The author tries to convince the reader of something. And so an example of that would be over here on the right side with the red writing here, an article about why we should eat more chicken and less red meat, okay? That would be an author that wants to convince you of something or persuade you, right? We wanna persuade you to eat more chicken and less red meat, okay? So that would be an example of something that could be written in pers to persuade. Uh, the I stands for inform, which is another reason that authors write things. So the author gives information about a topic. They're just giving information. They're not trying to persuade you. They're just um, giving the information. Okay, so this is, this is an example of a informative or, or a piece that would inform, and that is just a book about healthy food choices, right? It's just putting the information out there. This is, these are the healthy food choices. Um, anyone can read it and learn from it. That's in form, okay? One of the E's stands for explain. So if we read this little box here where the arrow is, the author writes the steps the reader will follow, okay? So you're explaining something. You're giving, say, a, um... okay. I apologize, my kiddos were needing something at that moment. Um, we were on explain. I think we're starting to talk about explain. So the E, one of the E's in Pied is explain. And it's where the author writes the steps for the reader to follow, okay? So they're going through a procedure of some kind. 
or like we talked about in one of our other lessons, maybe it's a chronological sequence type writing. Um, and an example of this would be a recipe for a healthy chicken dish. So like I showed you my, rest, my uh, cookbook, that's what that would be. Um, this would be like an explain type text because it's explaining how to make things, okay? And then the other E stands for entertain, which is uh, when the author writes something the reader will enjoy. So it's purely for entertainment, just maybe it's funny, maybe it's really cool, like old history or something. Um, so this is uh, a fic, or it could be a fictional story, right? About a goat that eats healthy foods instead of garbage. So um, I actually have a fictional piece in here, which, you know, we're talking more about informational text, but the entertain part can come in uh, with a fictional text because that's for entertainment only, typically. Um, and the D in Pied stands for describe. So the author uses some of the senses to tell about a topic. So they appeal to the senses. Uh, and an example I could think of for that was, would be like an article that is giving a review of a restaurant and its delicious, healthy options. So they're probably gonna talk a lot about how things taste, how they smell, how they look, what the restaurant, maybe uh, the atmosphere in the restaurant. And um, so that would be a, an example of something that's describing something using the senses, appealing to the senses. So this is also another example of one of those things. If you wanna pause this video and copy down this chart, feel free to do that because it's helpful to explain the PIDE method, which is what we're gonna to use today. Author's purpose. Okay, so this is our first text that we're going to read through together. And this is something I just wrote really quickly to give an example. So at the end of this, we're going to choose which uh, form of writing or which type of author's purpose we think this text was written for. So we're gonna look for clues in there um, about why, you know, why we think it's uh, which type of purpose. So we just read through the five different types on the pie chart. And um, I'll just review them really quickly again. Why don't we just jump back and just look at them? So we have persuade, we have inform, we have explain, we have entertain, and we have describe. And if you did take these notes down, uh, you'll have them to reference throughout. So again, you could even pause the video right now, take your time, copy this chart down, um, and then we'll go ahead and go on with this uh, piece of text that I wrote. Okay, so this is the text I wrote. Let's read through it together. So puppies make the best pets. They are by far the best animal to cuddle with. They are smart and funny to watch. Since they are smart animals, they can usually be very easy to train. If you have the proper fence or home for them to live in, they can be fairly easy to care for. Compared to other types of pets, they are so much better. You can't cuddle a fish or a snake. Cats can be finicky and even scratch, especially little kids that try to pick them up. Cats also don't stay around as well as some dog breeds. Turtles are cute, but not, very, not a very exciting pet. If you are considering getting a pet, puppies are the way to go. So what type of uh, author's purpose do you think this writing has? What do you think my reason for, for writing this would be? just based on some of the words that are in it, some of the ways that I've outlined certain things or emphasized certain points, what do you think um, the purpose of this would be? We're gonna go to our little um, multiple choice here. And again, always feel free to pause the video at these points if you would like to have more time to look over the options and make a guess and I'll give you time to do that. And you can also pause at this um, point to do that. So what was most likely the purpose for this text? A, to inform the reader, B, to entertain the reader, C, to persuade the reader, or D, to describe something to the reader. 
And this is where it gets tricky because, I mean, you could really try and apply these, all of these, to any text that you read. Um, so what is the best answer in this scenario? What is the text about puppies trying to uh, do for the reader? So go ahead and feel free to pause right now if you want more time to guess before we show our answer. Okay, so the answer for this one, for the best answer, was C, okay, to persuade the reader. So the text compares other pets to puppies and tells why the author thinks puppies are better. So do you see how that goes? I did describe puppies. I put a lot, you know, some detail in there. I was informative with my writing. I was telling people how, you know, it is to have a puppy and all these things. But my main purpose was to persuade someone to really uh, choose puppies over any other type of pets. So do you see how that works? So that was our first example there. Now I have another piece that I just wrote, um, came to me and I just wrote it. So it's called Oklahoma. And let's just read it through it together. We're gonna do the same type of thing at the end of this passage. And we're going to decide what the author's purpose was for writing this piece. Okay, so let's read through it. I can't remember a time when I visited this state that I didn't see beauty all around. The green rolling hills that span for miles are a sight to see. The darkening skies and clouds rolling in completes your view each summer day. The feel of the wind is always around, no matter what season. The air feels different than it does here where we are. The air has a moist feel as opposed to our dry days. Sure, there is a real fear of tornadoes in this state, but the storms are beautiful to look at. Fresh green trees and grass surround your every move. The grass comes right up to the pavement you are driving on. The farm fields and oil rigs are part of the landscape and are beautiful. Okay, so you can pause at this point in time too if you'd like to read uh, through this passage a little more. Look for those clues as to what type of purpose did I have for writing this piece? That would be my author's purpose. So look at some of the key words you can see in there, maybe some of the adjectives you can see in there. So it's just scribing words. Okay, and then we'll move on to the next, the next slide, which is where we're gonna answer the question. And again, if you need more time on this part, go ahead and pause it. But we're going to um, talk about why did I, the author, write this passage? So was it A, to entertain the reader, B, to inform the reader, C, to persuade the reader, or D, to describe something? Take a moment, make your choice. All right, so the answer that we're gonna go with for the best answer is D. So I used a lot of adjectives, a lot of describing words, and I described the state of Oklahoma, right? In my perception, um, I described the look of it, the feel of it. Um, I probably should have even described the smell of it because I could. Um, the look, the feels, you know, all those things. So um, I was appealing to the senses. I was using the, that um imagery that we've talked about before the the um the detail right so i was describing something okay all right so now we're gonna read a pass it's um an article that's a little longer than the ones we've been reading so we did those first two short ones to kind of ease us in and now we're going to read this longer passage and do the same type of thing so i want you to look through this as we read it Go ahead and follow along with me and um, look for those keywords and phrases and things that tell you what you think this author's purpose is. Okay, so let me get to the article. It takes just a second here. Okay, I've got our news ELA, which is a good, uh, 
got a lot of articles on a lot of different things. So this one is, okay, about kids invent device to prevent flash floods. Okay, so we'll just start reading it. Now we'll go ahead and read the caption here. Sixth graders, Jose Perella and Ivan Martinez of downtown Doral Chapter Upper School in Florida work with teacher Rebecca Martinez to place a device to detect sediment buildup in a storm drain. The student's project, which aims to stop flash floods, was among five grand prize winners in the Samsung Solve for Tomorrow contest. Okay, it tells you a little bit about what's going on. So, in late May, storms flooded streets in Miami-Dade County in Florida. The floods made cars sink and turned roads into brown rivers. A team of local middle school students has a plan to stop this ongoing problem. Alyssa Newber, Bianca Verri, and Jose Perella are sixth graders at downtown Doral Charter Upper School. They designed a device to warn city workers when and where there's a danger of flooding. The team is one of five grand prize winners of the Samsung Solve for Tomorrow contest. The contest asks for science, technology, engineering, and math, which is STEM, solutions to the biggest challenge facing a school community. Okay, we're right here. I've been living the here my entire life and all of us have encountered problems with flooding, says Bianca. We knew that there was the problem, that was the problem we were going to tackle. Flash flooding can happen when storm drains get plugged up, especially during hurricanes. Overflow into the streets, hurricanes overflow into the streets. It's the leading cause of weather-related deaths in the United States. The student's device uses a laser system called LIDAR. LIDAR, it stands for Light Detection and Ranging. The device, if approved by the city government, could be attached to Doral's 2,575 storm and manhole drains. One device per drain. If a drain gets clogged with sediment, the device could send a computer alert to the city's stormwater management office. Then the stormwater management could send some, someone to clean the drain. We had our class help us in the beginning to, in, to find information about how we were going to use LIDAR, says Jose. The three STEM whizzes then started to work more closely with their science teacher, Rebecca Martinez. They figured out what each of them is good at. For Jose, that involved exposing the problem and coding. For Alyssa, it was calculating costs. For Bianca, it was understanding how LIDAR works. Okay, so class parents were in, who were engineers and website coders help them figure out the details. Starting in March, the school was closed, so team meetings went virtual. Luckily, says Bianca, we already had a prototype device and we just had to tweak it some more. They also had to pitch their idea virtually to contest judges. 20 finalist teams were whittled down to the five grand prize winning teams. A team from Doherty Valley High School in San Ramon, California, made a, a wildfire alert. At Fairfield Senior High School in Fairfield, Ohio, students designed an app to prevent deaths of kids left in hot cars. Students in the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics in Durham invented an app that helps people recycle. And in Wisconsin, kids at Omro High School created a sensor that lets ice fishers know when it's safe to walk on frozen lakes. Okay. Each of the five teams won $100,000 for technology and supplies for their science classrooms. The Doral students plan to continue working with the city after the months they spent on the project. We put in a lot of effort and had to trust each other and that each one knew what they were talking about, says Alyssa. Figuring out how to build the drain sensor was overwhelming at the beginning. I'm not an engineer, says Martinez, but I learned the kids can actually do this working together as a team. Okay, so that is our first article. Okay, and we're going to uh, figure out what we think the purpose was for this article. Okay, and I've given you all five of the choices here. So this is all five in the PIDE um, chart. So the first one is to persuade. The second one is to inform. The third one was if it was to entertain. D would be to describe, and E would be to explain. Okay, so just based on what the article was kind of about, do you already have a thought um, as we read through it? It was a lot of information, but what was the overall kind of uh, feel to the article? Okay, so what you can do is ask yourself, 
um, were they trying to persuade me to do something? Do you, did you feel like you were being persuaded? Did you feel like you were being informed? Did you feel like you were being entertained at all? Um, do you think they were just describing something, like going through the steps to describe something? Or do you think they were explaining uh, like how to do something? Um, those are the questions you can ask yourself. And then we can um, look at our answer. So the best answer for author's purpose Okay, would be answer B. So that is to inform, which this text was a story about some kids that found a solution to a problem. Okay, so does that make the make sense about the best answer? It wasn't really trying to persuade us to do anything. Um, it wasn't really entertaining as far as it wasn't funny or um, anything like that. And it was a nonfiction story. It's actually uh, like a news story. Um, they were really, they were describing the device, but it wasn't like they were just being really descriptive about this storm drain um, device. And they weren't really explaining how to do something. They were just giving us the information, which is informing us. Okay. So good job. That was a long, a long article um, to bear with. And uh, we're going to do the same thing on the next one. So Let's jump right into this one. I think this one is a, is a fun article, um, just going into it. And we're gonna look for our author's purpose as we read it together. Okay. It's another news ELA article. Found some good stuff on there. Okay, so this one is very relevant to us right now. And this is establishing a new routine for distance learning. So whether you know yet what your school district will be doing, um, we all know that uh, there's a possibility for some distance learning in our future. And we've already been doing that in the spring and maybe even some of you in the summer. So when I found this article, I thought it was really interesting for uh, some really good, good uh, information. So Let's uh, go ahead and start with the little pictures that are at the top, showing these kids doing something, right? Nope, did I skip the title? Okay. Alrighty. <laughs> so, they say how to be successful when you're learning from home. Stick to a routine. These are the illustrations we're looking at. So again, just bear with me, read along. And we will, uh, you can take notes if you'd like about just different key words you see or anything like that to tell you what this author's purpose was, okay? So with schools closed across the country due to coronavirus, many teachers and students have transitioned into a period of distance learning. This is a big adjustment for most of us. You probably miss seeing your friends and teachers, going to special events like games and dances, and even participating in ordinary parts of the school day like lunch or short breaks. You might also miss, without realizing it, the routine that school brings to your life. As school day schedule helps us structure our time, oh, a school day structure helps us structure our time. It tells us when the day begins and ends and how to spend all the hours in between. The school day builds in time for learning, physical activity and play, creativity, socializing, eating and talking breaks too. Without this routine, a day at home can feel endless. Luckily, there are steps you can take to create a daily routine that works for you and provide some of the structure you're missing. You'll want to make sure your new routine allows you time for both productivity and rest. Okay. Every family situation is unique, so we can encourage you, we encourage you to talk with your family members about what would make the best schedule for you. Talk oh, together, you can write down a list of what needs to get done in a single day. Remember to include the essential stuff and the fun stuff too. Work together to slot out how much time is needed for each activity and what time of the day is best to tackle it. Once you've planned your daily routine, write out a final version and post it somewhere that your family can see and refer to it. Keep others in your household in the loop about how you have planned out your days. You can make changes to your routine in the days and weeks ahead. It may also, it may take time to figure out what works best for you in the new circumstances and that's okay. You don't have to follow your routine minute by minute. It will help you. Um, sorry, I lost my place. 
Okay, so you don't have to follow your routine minute by minute, but it will help you look back at it, at it periodically. Let your routine grow with you and it will keep you on track. Okay. To get started, here are, some, eight, here are suggestions for blocks of time to schedule in your new routine. Okay. Take a little mental break, think about what we just read, and then we're gonna continue with the next uh, little paragraphs here. So it's got this little sample of a, of a kind of a schedule on the side, okay? So this one says, get ready for the day. Even though you no longer have to rush to the, catch the bus or carpool, it's still a good idea to wake up at a regular time every morning. Set an alarm and try to stick to it each weekday. Starting your day by getting dressed is also a good idea. Hanging out in pajamas may be comfy, but changing into fresh clothes is a signal that you're going to be up and about and getting things done today. Comb your hair, wash your face, and brush your teeth before starting your at-home school day, just the way you normally would before running out the door. Okay. Once you're dressed and ready, review your schedule for today. What do you want to accomplish? What needs to get done? What would you like to do or work on? Share your day's goals with a sibling, parent, or someone in your household to help get yourself motivated. Okay, it talks about breakfast now. Maybe you like to start the day with a bowl of cereal or a plate of fruit. Or maybe you prefer a hearty breakfast of pancakes and eggs. Either way, it's a good idea to fuel your body with food before you start your at-home school routine. Be sure to block off time for breakfast. Okay, quiet study. Aim to schedule at least two stretches of time during the day for quiet learning. This time can include reading new material, completing homework, or taking tests or quizzes. Try to find a quiet space for these study times, away from the flow of family traffic. Closing the door and wearing headphones can help you focus. You may have siblings or cousins at home who want to chat with you or who play noisily around you. Help them get set up with something to keep them busy while you're studying, like an assignment to color or read their own book. When you're planning quiet study blocks in your day, think about the times of day in your home that are quietest and best for studying. Maybe during younger family members' nap times. Okay, group study. This block of time might include virtual class or lectures if your school is offering that option, or maybe you have a group project to work on and you need to reach out to some classmates. Your school or teacher might suggest specific times for this kind of learning. If so, build your schedule around those blocks of time. You may want to plan on some extra group time too, during which you can chat with your classmates and ask questions about your schoolwork. Okay, and here's lunch. Just as you would in school, make sure to step away from your studies for lunch. Practice your sandwich making skills, or perhaps there is a caregiver in your house making lunch for you. If so, be sure to thank them. Take a break while you eat. If someone is at home with you, have a chat with them or look out the window. If you can, try to skip eating your lunch at your workspace or in front of a screen. Okay, good advice. Reading time. Many students have to read for a certain amount of time every day for school. If you're one of them, be sure to make time for that in your routine. You might also want to schedule time to read for pleasure. Reading is the best way to be an armchair traveler, especially when you are feeling cooped up at home. Okay, writing time. You could work on writing assignments during blocks of quiet study time, but if you like to write, consider creating a separate space in your routine for open writing time. If you don't have any pressing writing assignments due, try recording your thoughts and observations in a journal. We're living through a very unique time in history. It might be worthwhile to record what is happening now for future generations. Okay, elective time. Electives like music, languages, or art are just as important now as they were in the ordinary school day. Build an elective time to practice your instrument, create artwork, or explore another idea or activity you're excited about. This stretch of time could also be used to work on a special project like perfecting your free throw, coding online, learning to knit, or solving a Rubik's Cube. Breaks. Make sure your daily routine leaves time for regular frequent breaks. After about an hour or so of study time, it's best to walk away from the computer, book, or paper in front of you. Need fun ideas for five minute breaks? Check out this list of suggestions. So there you go, there's a little, um, if you wanted to get on News ELA, there's actually, um, there is, I saw it earlier, and it's a list of awesome ideas for five minute breaks that you can take in your day. So maybe you wanna check that out. Hope you guys are enjoying the article. I think it's fun, it's long, but it's um, kind of giving me a lot of inspiration for 
the continuation of our distance learning. So now we're getting to dinner time. Wrap up your routine with end of day tasks that help like helping plan or prepare dinner. Perhaps you can slice vegetables and boil the water for pasta. Be sure to ask for adult supervision if you need it. Over dinner, share something about your day with your family members. They can do the same with you. And after dinner, try to help with cleanup too. You can take out the garbage or offer to do a chore to help someone in your household. Evening and relaxation time. Thanks to your new routine, you've accomplished quite a lot. End the day with something that helps you relax and unwind. It could be playing a board game, watching a TV show, reading a book, or making art. The choice is yours. And sleep. Same as having a set wake-up time, going to bed around the same time each night helps your body settle into a healthy routine and habit. Challenge yourself to be ready for sleep at the same time each weeknight. This way, you'll get the real deep rest you need to start your routine all over again tomorrow. Okay? Lots of information, but good information. If you're not already doing some of those things, maybe you'll be able to start doing those things. So just like with the other one, what was the purpose for that whole long article? What do you think it was for? Do you think, um, here we go. So yeah, why did this author write this article? Why did they write it? Um, so instead of doing a multiple choice, what I wanna do right here is you can pause the video for as long as you need to, and I want you to compose or write an answer to this question. So this is where we articulate, we talked about that earlier, or explain how author's point of view is conveyed in the text. So what is this author's purpose? Why are they writing this article? Are they trying to entertain us? Are they trying to persuade us? Are they trying to inform us? Are they trying to, what are they trying to do, right? Are they describing anything in detail uh, just for the sake of describing it? Um, are they explaining something? Okay, this is where you can pause the video and go ahead and work on your own response. Go ahead and try to make it three, like give me three um, pieces of evidence as to why that is the author's purpose. Something you, you pulled from the text. It doesn't have to be a direct quote, but it can be uh, just anything you remember about the article that proves your author's purpose. So go ahead and take your time now. Pause the video. Take uh, five minutes or so. Okay, so I hope you had time to go ahead and, and write down your answer and really think about what the purpose of this article was and uh, give those reasons, right? You gotta give those, those reasons why, okay? So let's go ahead and go to our answer. Okay, this was my, com my response that I composed about that article, okay? And you'll kind of see what I'm talking about with giving a little bit of uh, the evidence from that article. We talked about text evidence before. Um, this is kind of using it in this, in this way. So this author wrote this article to explain to the reader how to establish a new routine for distance learning. The author gives step-by-step -step instructions for how to structure each part of your day to establish more of a routine. The article goes in chronological order to map out the whole day from waking up to going to sleep at night and everything in between. Okay, so does that sound like a, a good purpose for this article? It was to uh, kind of go through the steps with us, right? And it, it actually outlined and explained the uh, routine that you should try and you know keep with your distance learning. So for me, the best answer was explain, right? This, is, this article was to explain how to establish a routine for distance learning. Okay, so you can compare your answer to mine and kind of see what differences and similarities we had with our answers. Okay, and we do have one more article to read. Here's our last article to analyze for author's purpose. It's not as long as that last one, so just bear with me for this one. It's, uh, and think about again, author's purpose. What is the purpose for writing this article? Okay, so this article says the best and worst Girl Scout cookies. 
ranked by a panel of pastry chefs and scouts. Okay. All right. Go ahead and read through this. So this image right here is uh, some children, some girls, and so they discuss the various flavors of Girl Scout cookies. Okay. The article starts, no need to check the forecast. The only one that matters right now is that Girl Scout cookie season is upon us. With this magical time of year when kids, when kids hawking sweets appear at grocery store booths, comes the inevitable forming of camps. Are you Team Samoa or a diehard Thin Mint fan? Does peanut butter trump lemon? To settle such divisive matters, the Washington Post brought in a panel of judges who were more than up to the task. We enlisted two professional pastry chefs, Claudia Baravecchio, I'm gonna just guess, of Fiola and Paolo Velez of Kith and Kin. And since no one knows Girl Scout cookies better than the folks who sell them, the Post added three local scouts, 13-year-olds Kamora Bugs and Rose Donlin and 10-year-old May Mamie. The Post grabbed boxes or bags of all eight cookies being sold in the area and added the regional lemonades and got to work testing them in the Washington Post food lab. What followed was an afternoon of munching, sugar-fueled, giggling, and plenty of <laughs> That's a different word than I've ever seen. Okay, as well as some brainstorming. Here's a suggestion for Girl Scout brass. You probably should hire Kimura to develop new flavors for you because she came up with several promising ideas. A sample, a cookie that's like a brownie, but just the edges. Okay, sticking with the recipes that already survived the research and development phase, here's how the panel rated the cookies from least favorite to cheer worthy. So number nine, Toffee Tastic. This one earned a unanimous nope from the judges. I don't like it in any regard, Ross sniffed. The tasters agreed that there weren't enough toffee chunks in these otherwise plain cookies. But when they hit a chunk of the confection, they didn't like the sensation. I thought my tooth had cracked, Kamora said. Velez zeroed in on the first listed ingredient, rice flour, which she noted swells in absorbed water. As a reason, the cookies were gumming up her throat. And once the tasting was done, she conducted a science experiment to prove it, crumbling the cookie on a plate, dousing with water, and watching it expand to the panel's horror, horror slash delight. <laughs> so they made the cookie puff up huh, by adding water to it. Okay, so the trofoils. Predictably, the kids on the panel found that there simply wasn't enough going on with this straightforward, shortbread that bears the Girl Scout logo. I think it tastes very plain, May said, and it tastes more savory to me. Its lingering flavor left a bad taste in some judges now. At first it's good, and then it's Ross made a face. What is that aftertaste, Kimora wondered. What is it? But the pros actually found it to be kind of a snooze too. Just boring, Baravecchio concluded. So number seven was Girl Scout s'mores. Kimora offered a hack, which we didn't try in fairness to all its cookie competitors, to make the graham cracker-esque sandwich cookie more closely resemble the real campfire treat, which her troop has enjoyed on scouting trips. They're so good in the microwave, she said, the marshmallows and the chocolate melt. I like how the filling is sweet, but the cookie is not really sweet, May noted. Overall, the panel found it a touch too sweet and the faux marshmallow texture got middling marks. I was bummed that they didn't actually put marshmallow fluff in there, Velez lamented. It was like eating an Oreo, but with graham crackers. All right, so number seven, Lemon Ups. This lemon cookie, a 2020 debut that featured positive messages such as, I am a go-getter, was a Sahara desert of sweets. It's crumbly texture making everyone reach for their glasses. Ugh, can I have more water, Ross asked. This one kind of dries up my whole mouth, Velez said though she thought it might serve well crushed up and mixed with much needed butter or um, as a crust for a lemon tart. Baravecchio was turned off too by its fake lemon aroma. Okay, so number five is Tagalongs. The chocolate coating on these peanut butter top cookies started, off, started turning off the judges as soon as they picked them up from the plate. It gets messy, may complain the second I touched it. It started melting in my hand, agreed Ross. 
who also took issues with the distribution of the peanut butter, which doesn't extend to the outside edge of the cookie, making for uneven bites. Barvecchio said that's something professional chefs think about a lot. That's a very good point, she said. When you're making petit fours or cookies, um, you have to think about that. How is the customer going to be eating it? May suggested a darker chocolate would be better, be a better choice. And Velez disliked the texture. It felt like a gusher, but with peanut butter, and I'm out. <laughs> they didn't like the tagalongs, huh? So this is the lemonades or lemonades. I don't know how they pronounce it. The panel liked the looks of this lemon crisp, which features the image of a citrus slice pressed into the top. The design is pretty, Ross said. Several panelists docked it, though, for not being original. It's a ripoff of Savannah Smiles, Tamora said, referring to a previous lemon cookie the Girl Scouts sold. And the citrus flavor missed the mark. I thought it tasted and smelled like manufactured lemon, May said, a comment that drew nods of agreement from both Velez and Baraccio. So we're down to number three now, we're up to number three. So do -si -dos. The grown-ups in particular seem to like the salty sweet combination the peanut butter on peanut butter sandwich cookie offered, and their high scores boosted its ratings. I like that there are actual pieces of peanut in here, Velez noted. It aerates the cookie and creates crispness. I like that it's salty and not too sweet, Rara Vecchio said, noting that she wasn't too familiar with the signature ingredient. We don't have too much peanut butter in Italy. Kimura thought the filling to cookie ratio was just right, but ultimately, the younger judges concluded that it was also, wasn't also ran. It wasn't also ran. All right, it's good, but like when all the Thin Mints are gone and all the Samoas are gone, I'll eat this, Ross said. Which brings us to Samoas. The silence as the post served this ring-shaped cookie topped with caramel, chocolate, and coconut was a testament to its popularity. Instead of just a nibble, most of the panel was chomping. Coconut can be divisive. May loves it, but Ross despises it with a passion. It won the high scores from enough tasters to make the runner up. Still, even among its biggest fans, it seems that Samoa's, Samoa is best enjoyed in moderation. You know how you can buy Girl Scout cookies and some of them you can binge and like eat forever, Kamora asked. This isn't one of them. They're kind of heavy. Okay. And the number one, thin mints. A sign that we were about to meet the big winner. As the post passed out the iconic discs of mint-infused chocolate, a chant of thin mint time, thin mint time went up around the table. Some tasters preferred the darker chocolate coating to its sweeter milk chocolatey sisters. Tagalongs were looking at you. I like that it's really chocolatey, May said. Kimora and Ross liked that it was it was vegan. They both tried the animal product free diet for a while. And its crunchy snap was an, all, was an around the panel hit. It's a good texture, Baraccio said. She even found the minty flavor more genuine than the others. It's kind of refreshing in a way. All right, so there we go. I guess that was a little bit longer video than I meant for it to be. <laughs> I mean, not video, but article. So last chance to do our author's purpose, okay? What is your feel from that article? Do you think it was informative? Think it was to describe something? Do you think it was to uh, persuade us in some way? What do you think your answer was? Go ahead and pause the video. Take a moment. Actually, I think I've got I've got the multiple choice on this one. So go ahead and pick from those two. Um, I mean, those four. I'm sorry, I cannot count. Pick from those four options, which one you think is the best, best describes why this article was written. Just um, pause the video and go ahead and come on back when you're ready. Okay, so I've got my answer here for this video. The best answer for me was C. And that was just to entertain, okay? Because it was kind of a silly um, topic. I mean, the idea of just taste testing Girl Scout cookies and figuring out which one's your favorite, um, that's not really um, informative. It, they're not really trying to persuade us. Maybe they're trying to persuade us a little bit um, to have a favorite Girl Scout cookie. But my takeaway from this article was it was to entertain. And that is 
simply uh, due to the fact that they weren't really um, writing it to, like I said, inform or persuade or to describe something. They did describe the cookies in the article, but um, it was more or less just for the sake of the article. So really they're just trying to kind of entertain us. It's just kind of a fun story to read, right? So that's where we're at with that. Okay, so we get, went through all of our articles. Thanks for bearing with me on the long articles, um, just because we're sixth graders, so we can totally uh, dive into some longer, longer pieces. So uh, I hope you enjoyed the articles we read. Now this is going back over our objectives for the day. So the first objective was, I can articulate the author's purpose in informational text. So the next bullet point tells us that we accomplished this objective by being able to choose the author's purpose for writing a text. So what we were doing by answering our questions, our multiple choices, and then we had the one where we wrote out our answer, okay? This, this third bullet point is our second objective. I can explain how the author's point of view in a text is conveyed in an informational text. So we accomplished this objective with our writing explanation of author's purpose. So we had to do the little writing of the three sentences. That is um, how we are explaining author's point of view in a text and how the author conveys their point of view, okay? And that's by giving those examples. Uh, like when we said something was um, to explain, it was because that author was giving us uh, like a step-by-step. -step. They were explaining how to establish that routine. So that's how they conveyed their point of view, okay? So what I wanna do at this point is just challenge you guys, have some fun with this, go out there and um, kind of do what I did when I wrote the, the little piece on puppies and the piece on Oklahoma. It was really just, it didn't take me very long, like maybe five minutes. And I just decided what kind of piece am I going to write? Am I going to describe something Am I going to try to persuade somebody like I did with the puppies uh, that they're the best pet, you know, over all the other pets? Just pick a topic and uh, try to be the author and write a piece of text that either, you know, go through the pied chart. Hopefully you copied it down in your notes. And if not, you can look that up online anywhere. Just P-I-E apostrophe E-D chart and it gives you all of those different purposes for writing so go out there and have fun with it it's really kind of fun to add your details and just you know come up with your own piece as as an author so enjoy the rest of your day and thanks for being with me today for this lesson